Hey, good morning. Good morning. It's Friday. <laughs> yes, indeed. Made it through another week. You can definitely congratulate yourself, right? My goodness. Oh, man, the weeks just seem like they're flying by, but uh, it's all right. We're, we walk with eternity. How about that? <laughs> so it's all good. Good to be with you. Hope you are having a great day either starting out or ending, whatever. It's uh, it's always good to be with you and with him and walking together and all this fun stuff that we get to do, right? So let's say good morning to Norma Jean and Jane and Bernadette and Jack and Lindy, uh, Linda, Jackie, um, let's see, Susan, Ted. Great to have you guys along. I appreciate having you here to... Uh, talk to. <laughs> it's always nice knowing that there are folks there that are actually watching and listening. <laughs> um, Ada, good morning. So, you know, I, before we, we leave Matthew 18, I, you know, was thinking about this passage that we just covered yesterday, uh, where Jesus tells, you know, this amazing story about what forgiveness is all about and honestly if you missed yesterday you, you need to go back and and catch that one because you know what jesus teaches us here is one of the the most liberating truths that is ours as part of the new covenant and uh, just so so important but uh, one of the things that uh, I have found that kind of trips people up, uh, I know it tripped me up for many years before I fully understood what the New Covenant is all about, is how in the story, Jesus describes the King, right, the, the Lord in the story who at first forgave the man of the million dollars, or actually 15 plus million dollars, and then at the end of the story, because the slave was so unkind and unmerciful to his fellow slave, ends up reinstituting the punishment that at that time was in place for people who were debtors and couldn't pay their debt, right? And at the end of the story, when Jesus has this king speaking to the slave, you know, should you not uh, also have had mercy on your fellow slave, even as I had mercy on you, right? Which is really the, the, the takeaway, the big takeaway from this story is that, yeah, just as you had your debt ripped up, you needed mm -hmm. to rip up the debt of other people. So, but verse 34 is what uh, I think so many folks come away with the wrong idea about God our Father. Because Jesus says that his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. And you know, you read that and then hear what, or read what Jesus says next, so shall my heavenly Father also do to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. And so, you know, we hear that, we read that, and we, oh, wow, so if I mess up here, uh, God's going to get angry. Just like in this story, the king became angry with his slave over what happened and punished him. And so we take that and we project it on our Heavenly Father. That, well, that must be how God is reacting, um, <laughs> because well, didn't Jesus just say that the the King, the Lord in this story, was moved with anger and punished the slave? Well, I guess that's I have to you know be constantly concerned or even afraid that you know at any moment I might do something that would trigger the anger of God and the punishment you know, that he would then uh, release because I messed up, okay? This kind of thinking is is so, 
it, it, it so prevents us from entering into the kind of relationship with God as our Father than really, I think, any other uh, false teaching. You know, people have taken this and they have basically projected what Jesus says here about an earthly king, about a person, and project that on to the Heavenly Father, disregarding all the other um, scriptures and, and examples that Jesus gives us in his own life. Again, as he demonstrates the heart of the Father, you know, we never hear him speaking to anyone who comes to him for ministry and saying, oh, I'm sorry, this is the punishment of God on your life. <laughs> okay, you, you really messed up bad, and this is your punishment, so deal with it. He never says that to anybody, right? Now, after he, he heals and sets people free, he may say, go and sin no more, right? Lest something worse happen. But that, even that is not trying to, to insinuate that, well, if I mess up again, well, God's going to punish me again. It's nothing to do with punishment, okay? This, what this passage is teaching us about the way things work in the kingdom of God, okay? And you got to realize that the kingdom of God is in existence now in the spirit realm. The kingdom of God exists on the earth now in the spirit realm. It exists in my heart, in yours, as sons and daughters. If you have received Christ as your Savior, you're born again, you are operating in the kingdom of God. But it also exists all over the world in the spirit realm, even if people aren't yet part of it. They haven't entered into it yet. doesn't matter. It's still there, right? So what does that mean? Well, <laughs> there are certain things that God has put in place where in this kingdom that he has set up, if you make certain decisions, first of all, let me just say this. Every decision that we make as a human has a consequence. There are no decisions, you know, that we make that don't have a consequence. Because a, a decision means I am doing something, I am moving in a particular direction, and that is going to have consequence no matter what it is. You can't help it, <laughs> you know. If I decide to get up from my chair and walk upstairs into my kitchen for a glass of water or something like that, well, I can do that. What's the consequence? <laughs> you stare at an empty screen, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and and basically, well, what good is that going to do? Um, so every decision has a consequence. and And people will interpret consequence as God's wrath, God's punishment, when in fact all it is <laughs> is the outworking of a principle that the Bible talks about, which is we reap what we sow, right? There are consequences for our decisions. And when those consequences happen as a result of bad choices that we make, that is not the wrath of God. That is not the anger of God. That is just simply the way things work. When you make a bad choice, there's going to be a bad outcome. Maybe it won't happen immediately, but at some point, the consequences of a bad choice will catch up. And what are the ultimate consequences of the worst choice whatsoever, which is to reject his offer, his free offer of salvation, right? We know that the, the consequence of that choice is going to be an eternal separation from God. But that's not, even that is not God punishing. Again, it's simply the outworking of a choice that was made. And so when we read this passage, this story, this parable that Jesus tells about a king and his slave and the, and the 
uh, the outcome of this slave's poor choice of not forgiving uh, a debt that was owed him after having been forgiven a huge, unrepayable debt, right? You, you know, the, the consequence for you and I is that, as I mentioned yesterday, Jesus talks about how, you know, that the king handed this slave over to the torturers. Now, that sounds really bad, <laughs> but that is not a punishment that God, in, you know, institutes. Instead, what it is, is, hey, don't do this because here's the consequence. And I mentioned this yesterday, that when we choose to not forgive, choose to not release people from what they owe us, okay, there are consequences and they're not good. We enter into a place where our anger, our, our uh, resentment, our bitterness, you know, all the negative emotions that uh, are there because all I can see is this person and what they did to me. That has an effect. I become tortured over that. Because the enemy, as I said, agrees with that and will partner with that to make sure that we are affected negatively by our choice to not forgive. But it, it's so important that we understand that this, this isn't the punishment of God. In other words, he's not up there saying, oh, you messed up, lightning bolt, <laughs> you know, I'm going to punish you for this. No, he has simply set up for us clear boundaries and clear descriptions of what happens if we choose to go a certain way and to do a certain thing that he says why would you want to do that when it's going to be you know harmful to you <laughs> you know what i mean and when you start to understand why he has such a high value for wisdom, all of a sudden it all makes sense. It's like, oh, so your wisdom is what teaches me how to live the absolute best life that I could ever live. Because it's your wisdom that shows me, helps me understand the kind of life that you want for me to live. And, and yeah, I've got free will. I can choose whether or not I'm going to follow his wisdom in any particular area. And if I choose to not follow his wisdom, I have chosen to engage in what the Bible calls foolishness. <laughs> and all you've got to do is spend some time in the book of Proverbs to see what the consequences are for those who the Bible calls fools. Okay? Those of you old enough to remember Mr. T, right? I pity the fool. Well, <laughs> that's, that's right. If there's a reason why fools should be pitied because they're making choices that ultimately result in bad outcomes. So what are we to make of, you know, the scriptures that are, that are in this New Testament uh, new covenant that where the wrath of God is spoken of and there there aren't many okay but there are some you have um, Ephesians 5 uh, 5 and 6 is one that that uh, I think most of us are familiar with he says uh, for this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Now, people read that and go, see, see, God is mad. He's angry at the sins of these people. Well, no, he's not. God can't be angry at sin any longer because he dealt with sin through the blood of Christ. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them. Why? Because the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, was sufficient to satisfy the justice of God regarding sin. So God doesn't treat sin in the same way that he treated it under the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant Sin was merely covered over by the blood of those bulls and those goats and those sheep. It was not cleansed. 
Our, in our case, it's cleansed. It's gone. You got to read Hebrews, man. Hebrews lays its, this out with such great clarity. It's amazing. So when God sees us sinning, he says, you know what? I'm not going to punish you for that because I don't have to. You're going to experience the consequence of what you're sowing. And that's enough for you to realize that, oh, wow, that was pretty dumb. Why did I do that? Okay. But yet here it says that this wrath of God, which really is his, it was what he's put in place, right? The, the regime of consequences that are there. It says this comes upon the sons of disobedience. Well, what does that mean? Well, these are people who refuse to believe what God says. They have a settled unbelief or disbelief concerning the things of God and what God says. And he says, if that's your choice, well, here's what's going to happen. And ultimately, you know, that final judgment that, that occurs where it's too late. Okay, that's, that is really the only wrath, quote unquote, that's left because there will be a final day of judgment where God will send his wrath, his fire. He's going to burn up everything that, has, that was corrupted by sin and he's going to remake everything. Okay, but that does not apply to us. <laughs> we are not among the sons of disobedience. Okay, in case you wondered, the moment you got saved, you stepped out of that. Okay, uh, let me, before I forget, let me just one more time uh, mention that we're thankful now that we have our first sponsor for Breakfast with Jesus, and that, of course, is Jesus Book and Gift Store in Island. Grateful to my good friend Joe Catalano for being willing to partner with me in so many ways as we're looking forward to doing things together, helping people grow and become more settled and secure in their walk with the Lord. I can recommend his bookstore highly, um, Route 1 South and Island. They have, you name it, books, music, uh, church supplies, um, uh, choir robes, anything that you know might be needed for ministry stuff. Uh, plus, they've got a nice little um, cafe area where you can sit and hang out and just, you know, fellowship. So it's a really, really great place to be. And I, I hope you get a chance to uh, check it out. They are, um, uh, this month, there's a sale on music. And you'll find CDs as cheap as two bucks, okay? Plus, there's a sale on fiction books that are, um, some of them are five dollars per book, okay? And this week... If you mention Breakfast with Jesus uh, while you're at the store, uh, they're going to give you $5 off your $25 purchase uh, on anything other than Sunday school supplies. So that's a good thing. All right. So this, this issue of the wrath of God is one, the anger of God, is one that, that we have to truly understand. Because if we still live under this deception that God is mad at me. You know, he, I, I keep screwing up and I just know he's mad at me. <laughs> okay. It's going to hinder you from experiencing the fullness of his love, of, of his acceptance, right? Of, of all that he has for you. Why? Because you're going to be constantly kind of like keeping him at arm's length because you just don't know, you know, when the hammer's going to drop, right? When when he's going to just go, okay, you know, you messed up too much today, <sighs> bam. Never will that happen. Never will that happen. You see, for God to punish us for sin would be tantamount to saying that what Jesus did wasn't enough. And folks, that's just not true. You know, when Jesus hung there, and cried out, it is finished. He was not lying. It was truly finished. All that was necessary to atone for and remove, to cleanse, to take away. As John spoke over Jesus when he saw him, behold the Lamb of God who takes away, takes away the sin of the world. I mean, 
It's like, yes, that's the truth. Okay, that's how effective the blood of Jesus was. He was the propitiation, as John writes in his letter. What does that mean? That means God was satisfied on a judicial basis with the sacrifice of Christ. It satisfied God's sense of justice and holiness to be able to deal with sin in that way. Okay? God accepted the sacrifice of Jesus' innocent blood on our behalf, and we were justified. We, our faith in Christ, putting our faith in Him, enables God to say, yep, you're innocent, not guilty. Okay, so does this mean that God is no longer concerned about sin? Okay, not at all. Sin is doing things, having certain attitudes and perspectives and whatnot that, that are not going to be in line with His will, what He wants for us. Remember, He created us. He had a vision and an image, a, a desire for each of us to live an abundant life, a life of purpose and meaning that, that has uh, eternal significance, right? And if we choose to go in certain directions and to think in certain ways, that prevent that from happening, he's not happy. No, he's not angry. And, you know, he's not sitting up there going, I am just so disappointed in you. No, he knows us and loves us unconditionally while at the same time saying, let me help you here. <laughs> Could I please? Right? Would you, would you let me show you what I have in mind that, you know, I think you'll like a lot better than, than what you've been doing on your own. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> this is how he approaches us at this point. Why? Remember, what's his priority? His priority is relationship. That is why he created us. That is why he redeemed us. He wanted us back. He wanted his family back. And while he had something, you know, to some extent uh, with Israel under the old covenant, it still wasn't enough because, you know, as the Bible says, Holy Spirit could not come into folks under the old covenant. He could only come upon certain ones at certain times, and then he would have to lift off. We have this constant, ongoing, 24-7 oneness with God in Christ, and that's what he wanted from the beginning. So, if that's his priority, do you really think he is going to still do something, say something, that would disrupt what he paid so dearly to recover through Jesus' sacrifice? Right? I mean, think about it. Jesus endured all of the sin and the consequences of sin in his own body. He reached a point on the cross where he was so thoroughly identified with sin, as Paul writes this in, in, in 2 Corinthians 5 as well, that God made him, Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin, not just to have or carry or, you know, whatever. He, Jesus became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Jesus. That's 2 Corinthians, I think, 5, 21, right? So when he was on that cross, at that moment in time, when Jesus became sin, Jesus experienced for the first time in his existence what it felt like to be separated from his Father. He'd never known that before. Yet he was willing to, to endure that, the pain of that, when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, the Father never forsook him. Jesus, just for the first time, experienced what it felt like to be separated from his Father. And he did that so that we would never have to feel separated from the Father. And we never are separated from the Father. 
Okay. So I, I really felt that, that I needed to take today to really focus on you know, this part of the, of, of the story and how when Jesus relates the father to the, the, the actions of the king, the father is not doing anything out of anger or wrath or disappointment. You know, this whole thing about torturers. The father is simply saying, hey, if you don't forgive, right, this is what's in place. This is the consequence. Okay. It's not like he's up there saying, okay, I'm handing you over to the torturers. No, no, no. It's just what happens. Okay. It's the consequence of our choice. Any choice that I make that the Bible calls sin, what it means is I am choosing something that the enemy agrees with and gives the enemy the access and the right to place on me the consequence of that poor decision. Not God's fault, you know. It's like, it's like if I have a, in my hand, I have a, a extremely expensive, you know, uh, China teacup and I let it go and it falls to the ground and breaks into a million pieces. It's not God's fault. It's mine. I made a decision. Okay. And it's the same way with the consequences of our bad choices. Now, thankfully, thankfully, <laughs> He is constantly redeeming us and saving us out of our bad choices as we come humbly before him and say, help, Lord. <laughs> okay, that's what he does. And out of that experience of him saving and redeeming and, and, and rescuing me, I learn something. I learn some aspect of his wisdom. And realize that, yeah, wow, that was pretty dumb. I don't want to ever do that again. And that's what repentance is all about, is recognizing something and changing your mind and changing your behavior based on something that you learned. Okay. Again, don't ever lose his priority for you, which is relationship. If you keep that the main thing, which is what it is for him, You'll walk through everything in life with him instead of feeling like he has separated himself from you because you messed up. That never happens. <laughs> Romans 8, nothing can separate us from the love of God, not even our own stupidity. <laughs> That's a good thing. All right, I've gone over time on this one today, but let me say good morning to... This breakfast club, you guys are amazing. Look at y'all jumping in here. My goodness. Um, where'd I leave off? Hey, Pete, good morning. Kathy, aloha. Joanne, good to see you. Um, there's Donna and Allison, Princess. Hey, Joan, good morning. Dorothy, how are you? Boy, it's been a while. Um, let's see, who else? I hope I'm not missing any of you guys. Allison, I think I said hi to you. Amen. Thank you, guys. Appreciate so much that you're hanging out with me this morning. As always, thanks to you who are sharing this with your friends. I appreciate that. And please feel free. Uh, reach out if you have questions or you'd like to chat about what's happening in your life. Send me an email or a Facebook message. I'd love to hear from you. Hey, have a great weekend. Um, just a quick note, if you're around in this area, we are having our night of worship tonight in Cranford, and uh, I'd love to have you come and hang out with us and just get overwhelmed by his loving presence. We're in uh, the Harvest Training Center there in Cranford tonight, and uh, hopefully I'll see some of you there. So have a great weekend. Look forward to being back with you on Monday. So you are so blessed. Go bless somebody today and this weekend, all right? See you Monday.